Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming to you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. Have you had problems this year with your plants? Oh, I bet some of us have. I know I have. <laughs> We're going to talk about some of probably maybe like the top four problems, uh, maybe five if we, if we have enough time here to chat about some of the most common issues that we've been seeing this year for the 2024 growing season. Uh, and you know, I am not doing this by myself. I'm joined as always every single week by horticulture educator, Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. I've had lots of problems in the garden. Most of them have been self-inflicted. <laughs> it's all your fault. That's right. I, Lack I of tell, weeding. I, and... Weeding, watering, overplanting, uh, expectations, uh, time. <laughs> that, that sums it up. <laughs> yeah, that's that sums up a lot of problems. We could eliminate a lot of problems if we just had more realistic expectations of what we would accomplish in one growing season. It's already July, end of July. It, it's crazy. Yeah, I think that about wraps up the podcast for this week. And there you go. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for listening. You've been doing great. Looking good. <laughs> oh, man. But hey, let's celebrate a, a win. You texted me a picture the other day of a purple beauty, a purple tomato, a purple through and through skin, flesh, all of it. Um, so this is the it's the genetically altered uh, or bioengineered. I think that's the term we should be using the bioengineered tomato where they crossed uh that like a cherry tomato with a snapdragon gene that produces purple fruit through anthocyanin development which is that that purple pigment um in in fruit and you got a purple tomato so i need to know ken one how does it taste it was good yeah tastes like a tomato it's not quite as not as quite as strong as a tomato flavor a little less acidic or maybe a little sweeter but yeah it tastes like a tomato i don't have any extra limbs or anything growing on me at least as of yet so well listeners i haven't said anything to him but he's starting to turn purple as we speak <laughs> <laughs> no he's still he's still our red-headed viking friend here so no. yeah so it tastes less acidic less tomatoey but still a tomato still a tomato at least the the one um that we ate in and with that you know they're coming on green it's like wait a second i thought these were supposed to be purple and kept waiting and waiting and waiting and i hadn't checked them for a while and i checked the other night and oh look there's purple tomatoes there oh man i i have two purple tomato plants and they've been green for weeks uh, it's just a matter of time so you got the the stem with with multiple tomatoes on there because they're cherry tomato size and some of them are fully purple. Others are still green on that same stem. So they, it looks like they just have to hit that, like a regular tomato, they have to hit that mm -hmm. that full size, and then they'll start coloring up. Interesting. Well, I, I'm excited to try it. Excited to to see how it took how it goes. And um, and I guess these do come true from seed the following year, so you can potentially save seed. Now, when when we bought these, we had to like. There was a little checkbox agreement thing that we had to say, like, we're not going to sell these tomatoes commercially. We're not going to we're not going to do anything to make money off of these tomatoes. This is just something to grow in a backyard home garden. Um, so that but but I guess we could potentially maybe save seed. I just wonder how the germination rate will go if we do for next year, because it was awful this year. <laughs> out of 20 seeds, I got I got lucky. I think I got seven to germinate out of 20 seeds. And I was able to share some of those with some other people, but that's so yeah, yeah. If it weren't, if it weren't for you, I would have you know, 20 seeds or whatever. I had one come up and I had no cotyledons or anything. It was just mm -hmm. the the stem. And so I guess zero percent. Well, I guess it did germinate, but it didn't. So. so unsuccessful. I had one without cotyledons as well. And it was just, it developed this big ball on the tip of the stem, probably where all that growth hormone and energy is getting pushed to and it's like there's nothing there there's no leaf buds there's nothing to grow um so 
Yep. Germination rate, not that great. Yes. And for, for yours, have you been pruning off suckers or have you just been letting it go wild? Just letting it go nuts. Um, so it's, that's probably and, why yeah. mine have, have matured quicker because I've pruned off all the suckers. Hmm. So they're probably pumping everything into those fruit instead of now in the long run, you'll probably get more tomatoes than I will. But... Well, sounds like I need to at least go to one of my purple tomato plants and do a little experiment. I'm going to take the scissors to it tonight. You've convinced me because they're they're uh, Yeah. Those suckers really make the tomato plants pretty unruly, um, especially in my yard where space is at a premium and everybody's fighting for a little bit of sun. Yeah. Mine's basically a single stock. We've got tied up to a, a post. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I really, so I've adopted Ken's staking post technique where essentially you take like a two by four, right? Ken, you just rip it in half. I went and I cut like a little, I don't know, spear tip in it with the, uh, with the miter saw also. And you get like an eight foot, pretty sturdy stake for your tomatoes. So I did that this year too. I, I love that technique. You know, I'm not growing 50 tomatoes. I'm growing maybe a dozen at the most. So it works. I think in that scale, it works pretty well. Yeah, we've had some on the ground now for two, three years now. No, we had a couple that really started warping that we've taken out. They're almost like a C by the time they got done. But a lot <laughs> of them have stayed relatively straight. And we did have, I, I can't remember if we got 10-foot boards. Or 12 foot, but we didn't need a step ladder to pound them into the ground. Yeah. Because it could not reach even on my tiptoes mm -hmm. with the to get the sledgehammer on top. Yep. Same here. Had to get the ladder and the hammer out uh and get those pounded in the ground. And hopefully it, it lasts a long time. These aren't treated with anything. This is just cheap old pine board, you know, nothing, nothing special. So yeah, if I get two seasons out of it, I'd be thrilled. So I think we did use pressure treated. So it should last mm -hmm. several years, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, maybe we'll do a tomato trellising episode. Uh, well, the season will be over before we know it, but <laughs> eventually. For next year. Oh, so many topics that we can think of. Um, speaking of topics at hand, we're going to chat about some of the issues that we have been seeing, namely the summer, things that folks maybe email or call the extension office uh, that they're seeing. And these would be, multiple uh, phone calls that we've been getting, multiple conversations that we've been having with people. So it's not like a, an isolated incident necessarily. Uh, this is occurring throughout Illinois, throughout this growing season. So Ken, I we this started, this conversation started with the first thing here last year um, when you came to visit me here in Macomb. And in Macomb at our extension office, we have a C of purple cone flowers and every once in a while they get this thing which i had always told our master gardeners oh that's astra yellows but ken came and he said no it's not you need to do a little bit more investigation so ken can you tell me about what you found at our extension office and what i am now seeing more and more of in cone flowers now that i know to look for it yeah i think so this is um, coneflower rosette mite and then the symptoms look s somewhat similar to aster yellows and i think everything kind of gets lumped as aster yellows but there there is there are some differences so um with with coneflower rosette mite and we can pop a picture up here of what it looks like you kind of get these these tufts these spikes kind of galls on the cone part of the coneflower kind of like basically this proliferation of shoots um, that makes it look all tufty in there uh, and this is caused by an areophyid mite um it gets in there, starts feeding on it, and it causes uh, this these tissues to grow and get them all uh, tufted and stuff. Um, these are pretty small, so we actually put these under the scope, and you can put a picture uh, up here of the actual mite, and these are taken with a cell phone through an eyepiece on a on a microscope. It's not the best pictures in the world, but you can see them. <laughs> they're they're kind of carrot, almost cigar shaped, and this is not something you can really you can't easily see the mites with the naked eye. You need a hand lens. I have seen pictures online of sometimes I'm getting so many mites on there. You kind of get this white powdery stuff on, on the tips of that stuff. Those are actually the mites. Uh, there's so many of them on there, but I have not seen that 
populations that high um, personally. Uh, and basically when they get that high, they're, they're on the tufts uh, and they just kind of hang out there until something comes by, visits that flower and they'll grab onto it. And then that insect, bird, whatever they grab onto will move it to other flowers. So that's kind of one way they can spread. They're also really small. So I'm sure wind blows them uh, and stuff too. It makes the flowers personal preference, maybe unsightly. You could also think of it as a good conversation starter. Mm -hmm. um, depending on who you're talking to, they may or may not enjoy that. Um, so it could be a good way to end conversations too. If you, um, <laughs> so with that, you know, if you, if you've got that, you could, you could prune those flowers off, get, take them, get them out of the garden, dispose of them. So they don't, they're not spreading. Um, but it's not going to cause long-term health issues to those plants. Aster yellows on the other hand, um, and we can throw in pictures of some of the symptoms here. You get the flower petals turn green. Sometimes you'll get like shoots coming off the flowers of smaller flowers uh, and stuff too. Oftentimes the plants are going to be dwarfed. They'll start yellowing. So there's there's a few more symptoms going on with that. Um, and this is, is kind of a fatal disease. So if you see that, ask for yellows in your landscape. You want to pull those out. Um, those are spread by plant hoppers. So they'll feed on that. They'll spread this bacteria from plant to plant. So if you leave them in your garden, you, that does have the potential to spreading to other things. Um, and that will severely damage kill plants uh, if you leave it long enough. Um, I've, I pulled out two or three cone flowers this spring um, that had it. Now I did leave a plant in there in my garden a year or two ago. So I get lots of pictures. So I probably have more of it than I, than I should have if I would have pulled that plant when I should have. Um, so, but those, those you see with some regularity and I've been hearing a lot more uh, people talking about aster yellows uh, in their plants than I have the last couple of years. Seems to be, at least from what I'm hearing anecdotally, a little bit of an uptick maybe. Yeah, I agree. I, but fortunately, Ken, we, we, I, I met you and you taught me that when it comes to trying to compare aster yellows to the coneflower rosette mite, you got to look at the flower first and look very closely at that. But then you, the mite just affects the flower of the coneflower. Aster yellows affects the entire plant. Very often with aster yellows, you might you might get a malformed flower head, but it's usually not 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 always, but usually it's green. It remains green, um, so still has a lot of that green chlorophyll stuff in it. And so, um, yeah, just you, you taught me, Ken, look more closely and then also look more broadly at the entire plant. So when you're assessing these two disease or uh, issues yeah and, and aster yellows looks cool so take a few pictures but then pull those plants because it'll affect other plants too it's not just mm -hmm. cone flowers a lot of plants in the aster family thus the name uh, can get it as well so this is it's not something you necessarily want to leave around otherwise you could you could have lots of issues in your landscape potentially um, if you do leave that it's a lot of plants in the aster family so rogue it out yeah, and then don't just let it sit out. Um, I, I would probably bag that up. Um, so if there are any plant hoppers on the plant, you're bagging them where there's not sitting there for a day or two where they could potentially feed on it uh, as well. Yeah. All right, and I think our, our next one, which I haven't seen, but I've we've gotten some questions about, about it. I don't know if people have it or not, or they're just hearing about it. Uh, is oak wilt. And this has been one we've been he heard about and then been warning about for, for several years now. But I'm very fortunate that I have a, a network of arborists all around me that know what to look for when it comes to oak wilt. And, and unfortunately, it seems to be pretty common in, in sort of McDonough County where I'm located I've seen it also in Adams County and kind of throughout the western part of the state, uh, but I can really only comment sort of locally where I am in terms of how frequent it occurs. Um, now, oak wilt, uh, a lot of people will call and they'll say something's wrong with my oak tree. I think it has oak wilt. And yeah, Ken, you're right. A lot of people talk about it, but in many cases, it's not oak wilt. Uh, it's usually some other, often it's an environmental issue uh, or maybe some other insect or pest or disease but oak wilt 
even though I just said it is com it, it, it is occurring here, I wouldn't say it is a common thing that is happening all over the place, but it is definitely in my neck of the woods. Um, and we see it mostly affecting, uh, we, we break oaks in sort of two groups. This is kind of confusing, but one group is the red oak group and the other group is the white oak group. Kind of the way to distinguish these two different types of oaks I know, yes, there is a species called red oak and there's a species called white oak. I apologize. I didn't make up these names. I'm just <laughs> I'm, I'm just telling you how they did it. Um, but the red oak group, so a grouping of species, they often have points on their uh, on their lobes or on their um, on the tips of their leaves. So oak leaves are lobed. Um, and so the lobes is what sticks out. The sinus is what goes in when we talk about leaf shape or leaf morphology. So the little hairs on the tips of those lobes, that is what you see on a red oak, a species in the red oak group. In the white oak group, we have our lobes are rounded. There are no little pointed hairs or anything on, on the tips of those lobes. Um, they're just rounded lobes, rounded sinuses, and that is a, a key, a, a, a easy way to distinguish between the two types of oaks. When it comes to oak wilt, it can infect both groupings, but it is more aggressive with the red oak group. It's so aggressive, we have seen cases where particular red oaks, like a northern red oak, scarlet oaks, pin oaks, they will die in a matter of months, uh, which is very uncommon. When it comes to trees dying, it takes oftentimes it takes trees months, if not years, for them to succumb to a disease or an insect or something. When it comes to oak wilt in the red oak group, it can take months, if not weeks. Um, it can happen very quickly. Contrast that with the white oak group. Yes, they can get infected with the oak wilt uh, with the oak wilt fungus, um, but they can resist that infection. They can still be killed by it. But a healthy uh, tree in the white oak group can can usually resist it for several years, and in some cases grow out of it, They'll wall it off and grow out of it. So, um, so white oaks we're not as concerned about, but it can happen there. Red oaks, we are worried about that. And as somebody who has two very large pin oaks in my yard, I am very cautious about what happens to those trees yeah and then like the, the so the sy symptoms for that is, is kind of on the leaves you get the well, usually browning from the tips coming down in uh to the plant <clears throat> sometimes you'll have some green tissue in the middle which looks similar to bacterial leaf scorch yes um, so those can get confusing so this is one of those things you know if, if you suspect it i would send a sample off uh, to the plant clinic to confirm what you have because with oak wilt you're taking very drastic measures you're cutting trees down <clears throat> and you'll start getting canopy thinning and and then on trees that are, are infected i don't know if i'm not sure how quickly these fungal will form fungal mats under the bark um you gotta get these black mats with the, with the fungus and they're producing spores and that's what the the sap beetles will feed on which is one of the ways this is spread so they'll come they'll feed on that and they'll go to disperse and this can be long distances mile plus um and they'll feed on other trees. It happens to be an oak tree. Maybe you got somebody pruned it. It's wounded. It's producing sap. They'll feed on that, transfer that fungus into that, um, and it's spread. Um, so that's one reason why, main reason why we talk about oak trees, pruning oak trees, you don't want to prune them. I think I saw one recommendation, you know, in the spring and into July. I would say don't, I would say most people go with do not prune it during the growing season um, to prevent that. No. We've had a lot of storms. You've had a storm damage a branch. You, know, you need to clean that up. I think this is the one time where you'd want to put on some kind of wound treatment, paint, latex paint, something onto that that prune branch, uh, so the sap beetles can't get to it. It will slow down the healing process or the the um, the sealing process of that tree, but those sap beetles won't be able to get onto that cut surface uh, and potentially spread oak wilt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's so let's talk about submitting a sample if you wanted to test your oak for something like this. Um, 
as Ken described, we want to avoid pruning oaks pretty much during the growing season. However, in order to get a viable sample where our lab can actually culture out this disease, we need to have living tissue. We need to have a plant part or a branch that is infected, but not dead. And you heard how quickly this can potentially spread, especially through any red oak uh, type oak tree. So you're having to prune something during the growing season in order to get a sample. So according to our University of Illinois Plant Clinic, they really still advise not doing any pruning cuts from spring up until like the end of June into mid-July. So right now we are at the end of July. If you suspect you have oak wilt in your tree, now is the time when you could prune off an affected branch, which has wilted but living leaves, and some, and you want it to be at least that branch to be at least like the width of your thumb, maybe a little bit wider than that, and submit that to the plant clinic. And it has to be shipped in a cold container. That's this, which is it's crazy, Ken. You know, the oak wilt is such a, a devastating disease; it can be spread far and wide, but the thing can't survive for a couple hours severed from a tree. You know, it's it's crazy how uh, sensitive it is to to dying when it's not like on on a beetle or or you know you know inside the tissue of a tree. Yeah, I would say if you're if you're going to submit a sample, I, I would even think about calling the plant clinic first. Yes, um, and they can they can take you through the process, and we can include a a link in the notes to the the plant clinic website where they've got instructions and and ways to contact them and how much it's going to cost and mm -hmm. and all of that fun stuff. Um, and so that's. So the beetles is one way you can spread. I think the primary way, I think is what 80, 90% of the transmission is through root grafting. So when oak trees are growing together, when their roots come into contact with each other, they'll graft together. So you kind of almost have this just giant root system shared by multiple trees. So if one tree gets that oak wilt, it's going to go down on the root system and work its way through all those other trees that are attached to it. So yeah. you know, when, it, when it comes to management, if you do have it, you're, you're cutting trees down, destroying that wood so those fungal mats don't develop. And if you've got multiple oak trees, you're also severing root grafts. So going through the giant saw or trencher, basically, and cutting into the soil and severing uh, those root grafts to try to prevent that spread. Mm -hmm. And the trees, as as they die, the oak trees, they are, they are, they sacrifice those that last bit of energy, you know, that maybe they could have pushed into new growth. They take that, that those energy, that sugars, carbohydrates, all that, and they push it into those root grafts to the surrounding trees. And a lot of times if it's their progeny, like, you know, their seedlings that there's like a priority there of shifting that energy into those, that's their offspring, their genetics. So um, that just hastens that the spread of oak wilt, it just speeds it up and, and pushes it outward. And that's what a lot of my conversations have been with, with arborists and homeowners this past year. Like, all right, so you, we, we have a red oak, uh, you know, specifically in this one situation was a Northern red oak surrounded by other Northern red oaks. And then, you know, it, it's right behind, there's woods right behind there, full of oak trees, lots of other high value oak trees in this residential area. And so talking about timing of cutting down the tree and trenching and doing all of those processes and not only just one trench to, to cut off the infected oak, red oak, kind of the, you know, ground zero, patient zero right there, um, concentric rings of trenching to then separate other uh, oaks from each other. Because we kind of have to assume a little bit that those right adjacent to that first one that's infected those potentially could already be infected as well. So if you have high value trees, you can do a lot of destructive trenching to tree roots in an effort to save those trees. Um, it probably, it is expensive. It's a lot of work. Oak trees, you know, they'll respond also with canopy loss when they lose massive amounts of roots. 
And so it's it's a stress onto the tree itself. Uh, we're trying to prevent that tree from dying from oak wilt. Yeah, I, there, I think there is one fungicide you can use. I think it's an injection, mm -hmm. but it's it's a preventative. It's not a curative. So once your tree's got it, you're done. Um, but you could, again, it, it's, I don't think it's necessarily all that commonly done because it's not necessarily cheap. Um, so this, again, you're going to be getting into your high value specimen trees, things like that. Uh, was it propiconazole? It is. Um, would be, would you could potentially treat trees with to try to prevent um, them from becoming infected. But again, if they've got it, just cut it down. There's yeah. there's nothing you can do, especially with red oaks, um, to save them. And the problem with systemic fungicides is that the risk to resistance is higher because that active ingredient is ever present in that tissue, always getting exposed to whatever fungi or disease is trying to make its way into that tree. And eventually, after being exposed over and over and over again, one of those fungal cells develops a resistance because that propiconazole or whatever, to act, whatever that systemic active ingredient has been in there for years, and eventually something breaks through. That's just, that's just how it works, whether you're talking fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, and any of that stuff. Resistance develops the more exposure you have to that chemical. Lots of doom and gloom. Man, I feel really depressed <laughs> right now. Ted. We need to take a break. <laughs> Ooh. This is our job, though. We, we deliver a lot of bad news about yes. people's plants and trees and stuff, so I guess we're used to it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've ruined many a day with mm -hmm. my answers. It's like, how much does it cost to cut down a tree? Are you kidding me? That much? Yeah, it's expensive. Sorry. Yeah. So say just yeah, just summarize it. If you suspect it, um, send a sample off to confirm that's actually what you have. Um, because again, you are we're going the tree removal route here. We're not spraying to to save it. So I would say better to be safe than sorry. Make sure that's actually what you've got before you get into some some very expensive uh, management techniques here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, Ken, there there's one disease that I have seen a lot of this year and it happened a lot more. Uh, it seemed to come through more for you folks in kind of that central Southern portion of the state. Um, and that is fire blight on ornamental pears. Now this is one I'm like, yeah, it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> I don't really care about ornamental pears, um, the calorie pear, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I know some people do. Some people, this is a precious landscape tree. I understand that. Um, but I also recognize the fact that this is also a species that is invading our natural uh, wood forests and woodland areas. So, eh, you know, take the good with the bad, I guess. But I'm not too worried when a pear tree gets infected with fire blight. Have you been seeing a lot of fire blight in your neck of the woods? Yeah, this is the this is the feel good part of the podcast. Yeah, um, <laughs> kill those plants. Yeah, there's I've seen some. Um, so my neighbors have some um, calorie pear. Uh, it's got it's had fire blight in it for several years, but yeah, it's it's got quite a bit uh, canopy thinning and all the the strikes the the black shoots with the typical uh, shepherd's crook there. Mm -hmm. the, the tip curling over kind of looks like it got hit by lightning or somebody burned it. Thus fire blight. So. Yeah, seeing that, um, yeah, off and on, um, in, not only in calorie pear, but apples and crab apples, you can see it in there depending on uh, the resistance those may have to that. So, and that's one, you know, with, with calorie pear, personally, uh, that would be if, if you want to save the tree, prune it out. You typically want to go eight inches, maybe a foot past where you can see symptoms. So, typically on those branches, you'll see. That discolored canker, kind of a sunken area, you want to go 8, 12 inches below that to make your cut because more than likely you're going to have some of that of that bacteria in that branch that's not going to be symptomatic yet. So making sure you're cutting into clean wood. Um, ideally, you'd be doing this um, when it's dry or do it in the dormant season so you're not risking spreading this pathogen, um, sanitizing printers, ideally in between cuts. 
the, the recommendations are like 10% bleach solution. That's pretty rough on metal, cause a lot of pitting and stuff. So you can look at alcohol or like sanitizing wipes. Um, if you have some left over from COVID, you could use those to wipe off pruners uh, and stuff and sanitize them. On, you know, our, <clears throat> what I would say more desirable plants, apples and things like that, you, you're getting into a spray routine. Um, there's some, some antibiotics and stuff. I don't know if those are available without there's, a license. There's but you got to be careful with those because, again, that can you can develop resistance to those. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's copper sprays. Um, but really, in a home landscape, you're, bad, you're better off looking for plants that are resistant to fire blight um, instead of planting a susceptible cultivar uh, of apple or something like that. Just not going to eliminate the risk, but you're going to reduce that risk quite a bit right off the bat. Yeah, there. If that damage makes it all the way to the main trunk of your tree, also just it cut it down. There's really not much you can do from there. Um, as Ken said, there are some things. Most of them are available for like a commercial orchard grower or something like that. That's who would be using a lot of these products to try to protect protect some of their their tree fruits. Um, there's one brand, I believe, where you can buy streptomycin, the antibiotic, which, as Ken said, and I think as most people know, antibiotic resistance is a real thing in humans, livestock, and plants. So um, use with caution. Just uh, be aware of that. Yeah, I don't know if we've got streptomycin resistance in Illinois, but other states do have it. So that's when not to name names, Michigan, but <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. So that's when, you know, if you do use it again, make sure you're reading that label and do not use more than you need to, or more often than you need to, because you do not, we don't want to get resistance here because that just makes it that much more difficult to grow and manage. Yeah. And it doesn't look like they're coming out with new antibiotic formulations for homeowners uh, and probably not many, if at all for commercial growers as well. So Use them sparingly and just, yeah, cut down your calorie pair. I'm sorry if it is a beautiful price tree to you, but um, they're weak wooded. They drop branches all the time. They are they have a lousy growth habit. Their flowers smell bad. Smell what bad. other, there's <laughs> how many more reasons do you need? Yeah. There's better trees out there. Yes. I don't. If you, need, I, mm. if you need suggestions, stop by your local office and get an under the canopy guide we have hundreds and thousands to give out <laughs> yes if you need that under the canopy guide i will happily mail them out to you all i need is a mailing address and you're going to get at least 300 <laughs> all right so another one uh, that i think we're seeing an uptick in uh, now that it's getting warmer and drying out again is blossom and rot now usually Usually see this in in tomatoes, but you can also get it in peppers and um, cucurbits and all kinds of other things. But it's another one that's rearing its ugly head. It seems like. Yeah, it it's one that I've definitely got several calls about. I think because we had a very dry springtime, very dry early summer as well, and people maybe were watering infrequently. Uh, which can be, which is the cause for creating this blossom in rot. But then also we had a lot of, lot more rain in July here, um, which would have, again, swung the soil saturation pendulum to uh, way on one side. And then you swing back to dry and that's an inconsistent watering where the plant can't take up calcium into its uh, system up from the roots into its tissues and without consistent watering that calcium can't move and you wind up with blossom end rot which is key to that formation of that that blossom in or that that tissue skin part of that fruit so we that that is the cause although a lot of folks will say ah i just need to put eggshells or you know an acid tablets in my uh, tomato planting hole well, that probably won't hurt but it's not helping at least not this year eggshells are incredibly durable and strong it takes 
probably at least one growing season for them to break down for that calcium to the be then become plant available. So you you could grind them up small, tiny little particle sizes to then release that calcium. But guess what? Your soil already has probably enough calcium in it anyway. You are going to help reduce blossom in rot with consistent watering. And to achieve that, I say mulch, baby. You got to mulch. Got to insulate that soil with something so that it doesn't dry out and get like super fast. Mulch is your friend mm -hmm. in, in more ways than one. That's right. And, and I think we've done maybe a couple podcasts on this now. So we can always link to that. And if you want to get real, really into the weeds. And a lot of it will depend on, uh, we're talking about tomatoes, the cultivar. Some of them are just very prone to it. It almost seems like no matter what you do, they're going to happen. Beefsteak and, and things like that. And some of the, I think Roma sometimes, because it was really mm -hmm. elongated fruits, you see it quite a bit. But cherry tomatoes, never once seen it. doesn't matter how badly you treat them, how infrequently you water them. I don't think I've ever seen that in cherry tomatoes. So cultivar selection can play a role too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm mean to my cherry tomatoes and they still won't stop giving me cherry tomatoes. <laughs> Anything else come to mind while we've been talking? We really haven't had much in terms of like anthracnose. That's been pretty tame. Not much rust. Not many rust calls, nothing really about peach leaf curl, not like none of the usuals that I normally get. Japanese beetle has even been pretty quiet this year in terms of questions. Yeah, I don't think I've gotten a Japanese beetle question in a couple of years. That's they've really that's slowed down something. around here. I think a lot of us are just not as bad as they have been. We've kind of we hit that peak and now we're on the a downward slope for that. Well, maybe yeah. Well, let's talk about it then, Ken. Japanese beetles. Why aren't we seeing Japanese beetle questions? Do we? We don't know, do we? <laughs> <laughs> no. I say yeah. So for for here in Jacksonville, you know, I first started, we'd be getting multiple questions every year, every summer. Uh, but in the last several years, I I think even going back to COVID before COVID, they really started tailing off. I don't think last year, two years ago, I don't think we got any questions about them. I haven't gotten any questions about Japanese beetle this year. Um, so I think that that's probably multiple reasons. One, I think they've been around for a long time. Now people kind of know what to do about them. Two, I, and at least in my yard, I haven't really, I haven't seen any this year in my yard. And usually I'd see a few on cone flower. Um, my corn hasn't soaked yet. So, so I haven't seen them on there. See them on raspberries, but I haven't seen them this year. And w with insect populations, you know, though we've got the, the peaks and the valleys. And I think a lot of times with, with newer you know, invasive species and stuff, we get this this buildup. We get this really big peak, and then they kind of level out um, after a while as as new predators find them, or for whatever reason, those populations tend to level out. And I think at least here in Jacksonville, we've kind of hit that level out and and declining a little bit. Um, you know, yeah. So I I just haven't seen a lot. I haven't heard any reports of them being really bad anywhere in particular. I um, was talking with one of our master gardeners this morning. She said last year they've got a linden tree. <clears throat> they usually, you know, it like get down to like a third half of the tree eaten from the top. And I think she said last year it wasn't nearly as bad. This year it has very little damage on it so far. So don't have any particular reason, but I think we're just populations are low, it sounds like. Well, I'll take it. Yeah, I I remember they showed up in McDonough County the same year as Emerald Ash Borer showed up. It's like 2014, 2015. And I that was a very busy summer for me. And uh, the secretary, Lori, she would call back and she would say, you have another Japanese beetle question. And I felt like a broken record. I would just say the same thing over and over again, multiple times a day for about a month. And I even had an email just a, a draft you know, template <laughs> of what to do about Japanese beetles. And I just send, 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 send. And yeah, I don't, I don't use that email anymore. And uh, I don't even remember what I said back then, but it's, yeah, I, I will take it. We still have Emerald Ash Borer. And it's like, that is one invasive insect. That I think will probably be protecting our ash trees forever 
until we figure out if something else what to do yeah we used to do a um japanese beetle article every year for good growing and we haven't yeah. done that for several years now i haven't had to yeah well that was a lot of great information about some of the common plant problems we've been seeing this year Aster yellows is it aster yellows or is it a dastardly coneflower mite oak wilt some fire blight and of course blossom and rot which is a very common question and then hey a little bit of good news about japanese beetles not being so bad anymore at least for now we're, at least where we're at well yeah okay. where no we're angry as yeah. a deer inundated <laughs> yeah yeah the wave has pushed farther westward into missouri and kansas and stuff so apologize to all you people out there if, if you're listening it'll get better eventually maybe yes hope so <laughs> <laughs> well the good growing podcast is a production of the university of illinois extension edited this week by ken johnson and thank you ken for hanging out with me today as always chatting about oh them troublesome plants and why we love them so much so thanks ken yes thank you go uh check my uh cone flowers out make sure i got all my aster yellows out of there and see if i can find some mites sounds like a plan and uh let's do this again next week oh we shall do this again next week we got a garden bite coming at you so looking forward to that fun little short episode for you next week and then back to the old grind here as we get uh some end of the season good growing episodes back at you so well listeners thank you for doing what you do best and that is listening or if you're watching us on youtube watching and as always keep on growing Take a drink of my tiny cup of water. Mm. Go to the dentist. Got to last me all afternoon. (laughs) These are the same cups that they make you like spit into. (laughs) And it's going to require a greenhouse for me and maybe a a, a trip to the Bahamas. But other than that, we'll figure it out. I'm kidding. We won't do that. Cut that part out, Ken.